Hi, my name is David Pizarro. I'm a psychologist at Cornell University, and I study emotions, especially emotions and how they influence judgment. Today, I want to talk to you about one of those emotions, the emotion of disgust, and how it might influence your thinking in surprising ways. For a long time, psychologists have pointed to the power of emotions. In fact, emotions are those things that motivate us toward action. Many times, these emotions are things that motivate us toward actions that would keep us alive. For instance, our strongest emotions, emotions like fear, are ones that keep us from getting close to natural predators. There's a reason why we're afraid naturally of things like lions and snakes and spiders. But emotions don't only motivate us to behave in certain ways, like avoiding predators, they also seem to change the way we think about the world. That is, when you're fearful, not only do you want to run from the lion, but you're more likely to think that there are lions everywhere. And this influence on judgment has some interesting effects. What I want to talk to you about today is the power that the emotion of disgust might have on the way we make our judgments, and how a very natural emotion that keeps us away from things that might contaminate us or give us diseases also changes the way we think about our social, moral, political, and even our consumer decisions. Now, the insight that emotions could even be studied systematically probably first came from Charles Darwin, who wrote a book in the late 1800s systematically uh, documenting the universal nature of many human emotions. Psychologists in the 60s picked up this uh, original project of Darwin's and documented that across the world there appeared to be a set of universal basic emotions. And these, as I said, are the kinds of emotions that were, are around and universal because they help us adapt to our natural environment. So for instance, we have fear, surprise, disgust, anger, all of these are there in the human system, in the human mind, in the human body, because they give us a certain kind of survival advantage. Disgust is one of these basic universal emotions. That is, no matter where you look, no matter what culture you look to, some people seem to have this natural aversive response to things that are gross, things that might contaminate us or give us diseases. This is a good emotion. It keeps our bodies clean, right? Disease is something that we've had to deal with throughout most of human history. So avoiding disease uh, with this natural program of disease avoidance that we might call disgust is a very good thing. You can see the origins of this even early in infancy. Um, if you take a bitter liquid or a sour liquid and you put it into the mouth of an infant, a newborn, what you'll see is something very much like the full-blown adult disgust face. They'll wrinkle up their nose. They'll even protrude their tongue, trying to get that thing out of their mouth. In fact, when we make a disgust response, even though we can't see that we're sticking out our tongue, we're often actually moving our tongue in that same way. So one of the things that's very interesting about disgust, and actually one of the reasons I started studying it, was because it's very, very easy to make people disgusted. Some of the other emotions are hard to influence in the laboratory. That is, we can bring people in the lab and we can try to make them angry, we can try to make them afraid with various methods, but disgust we don't have to try very hard. I'm just going to give you one example of a disgusting image. Um, I'll just prepare you in advance and I'm about to show you something disgusting. Some of you might actually show that same emotion face that I just showed you where you wrinkle up your nose. Right, this is something that we might see in any day in, 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 in our lives, um, but it's something that probably has a profound ability to make you feel disgust. Some of you might feel it more than others. And in fact, when we look at the sorts of things that make us feel disgusted across cultures, uh, we see a very common pattern. As I said, these are things that tend to make us sick if we touch them or come into contact with them. So things like feces, urine, blood, vomit, rotten flesh, pus, all of those things are universal illustrators of disgust. That is to say, although we can override them sometimes, no matter where you look, people seem to respond with the same reaction. And the, it makes sense. These things are also things that might actually make us sick. They're signs of disease. Now, when Darwin was investigating the emotions, he wrote something that I think was very insightful. Uh, he says here, In Tierra del Fuego, a native touched with his finger some cold preserved meat while I was eating, and plainly showed disgust at its softness, while I felt utter disgust at my food being touched by a naked savage, though his hands did not appear dirty." So one of the things that Darwin is pointing out early on is that the same disgust reaction that he has, he saw in the savage. This was an early documentation of the universe, universal nature of disgust. But Darwin also points to something interesting, that is, that we not only feel disgust for things that might contaminate us by putting it in our, putting it in our mouth, or maybe by touching it, but we also feel disgust very easily at people, other people, people that might be foreign from us. And he also points to the fact that disgust, one of the real important features of disgust 
is that it works through contagion. To give you an example, if you stand next to a lion, I might be afraid of the lion, but I'm not now afraid of you. Disgust doesn't work that way. If you touch something disgusting, now that thing has the property of disgust. That is, through this association with the bad thing, that has now con been contaminated and I don't want to touch it. And if you think about it, this is a very good thing if what we're trying to avoid is disease. So before we had an explicit theory of how germs spread and cause disease, the emotion of disgust was tracking contagion. The power of contagion is at work a lot in, in the emotion of disgust, especially as we navigate our daily social, moral, political lives. Um, but also when we make our consumer decisions. Let me give you an example from one study. Uh, researchers gave individuals a mug and asked them, how much do you think this mug is worth? This was compared to a group who were just asked, how much do you think this mug is worth, um, but were not given the mug. And it turns out, in general, people think that their own, their own things are worth more. So if you say, how much would you sell this mug for? How much is it worth? If I've just given it to you, you actually think that it's worth more. But if I showed you disgusting images like the one I just showed you before, that effect goes away. One of the most robust effects that we like things and we value things that are our own more than those things that belong to others can be completely wiped out if we are now feeling disgust when evaluating the value of our own product. In another set of studies, if, dis if products that are disgusting touched products that were not disgusting, so in this case, uh, a product that has to come into close contact with the body, they use tampons. If tampons touched a bag of cookies, mind you, both of them were closed, um, and there was no, and they were clean tampons, there was no chance of any contamination going on, just the fact that people were disgusted slightly by the tampons made them value the cookies less. Now, this property of contagion that we can see in consumer decisions extends to what might be considered a very, a much more important domain. That is, we can make you feel disgusted not at cookies or a mug, but we can make you feel disgusted about a person or an entire social group. And this has been used quite effectively and quite tragically in many cases. One of the best cases comes from World War II propaganda, where the Germans were trying to convince people that the, not, that the Jews were filthy, disgusting individuals, in, in part to make it easier to kill them. So this, comes, this quote comes from a Nazi children's book published in 1938, trying to point the children to the disgusting, feature, the disgusting features of Jewish people. It says, just look at these guys, the louse-infested beards, the filthy protruding ears, those stained fatty clothes. Jews often have an unpleasant Swedish odor. If you have a good nose, you can smell the Jews. More recently, this very same tactic has been used to, by people who want to convince us that homosexuality is bad or immoral. So this is taken from uh, an anti-gay website. Gays are worthy of death for their vile sex practices. They're like dogs eating their own vomit and sows wallowing in their own feces. Again, these very low-level disgust properties pointing to human bodily products, for instance, or, dis or specific uh, descriptions of sexual acts get the disgust reaction going, and through the process of contagion, we tag an individual or an entire social group, and it gives us a very, very strong avoidance and negative response to that group. Now, one of the questions that my colleagues and I wanted to answer was, are some people just more prone, more susceptible to, to being convinced by this, this process of, of contagion? And so one of the things that we wanted to look at was, well, maybe some people who are more easy to discuss than others would be more likely to have some kind of negative attitudes towards certain social groups. And we were able to do that by looking across the population at simply put the levels of squeamishness that individuals have. Just as with many other basic universal emotions, while we all have them, some of them have them much stronger than others. So in this class, there are many of you who, when I showed that image, had a very, very strong response. Some of you weren't even bothered at all and wondered why I bothered to put the picture up. We can actually measure this level of squeamishness using a scale called the Disgust Sensitivity Scale and plot people along the line of how easily disgusted they are in everyday life and how hard to disgust they are. Um, we do this by asking a series of questions. Let me give you a couple of examples. Imagine that you were asked this, even if I were hungry, I would not drink a bowl of my favorite soup if it had been stirred by a used but thoroughly washed fly swatter. How, how much do you agree or disagree with that statement? Or while you're walking through a tunnel, tunnel under a railroad track, you smell urine. Would you be very disgusted or not at all disgusted? It turns out that I'm actually very, very disgusted, so it's, it's hard for me to do this research. Um, but we can plot a score given enough of these questions that gives you an overall score on how disgust sensitive you are, how squeamish you are. 
One of the things that this can do is predict your actual behavior. So the researchers that came up with the scale brought people into the laboratory and asked them to do a variety of tasks that were disgusting. For instance, eat perfectly healthy, in fact, very nutritious mealworms, but the, nobody eats worms really in the United States, so they're very disgusting. Um, or something milder, like eat a piece of chocolate that's been baked to look like, a shape, to look like dog poop. Um, it turns out people, find, people who are very easily disgusted are much less likely to do that than people who are not easily disgusted. So your score on this scale actually predicts your actual disgust response and your behavior. One of the first things we found was that disgust sensitivity, that is, level of squeamishness, seemed to predict, of all things, political orientation. That is, people who are more likely to be politically conservative were also more likely to say they were easily disgusted. Another way of saying this, though, is that people who report being more liberal are less easy to disgust. You might imagine why one way or the other might make more sense. But this is the general relationship. And we found this over three, four, five different data collections looking at different populations until we finally came to a very, very big data set, at least uh, when, when speaking about psychology. We were able to look at nearly 30,000 respondents in the United States. What you see on this graph is that people who are very conservative there on the right are much more likely to report that they are easily disgusted. That's higher numbers there indicate that they're more squeamish. And on the other hand, people who are very liberal are actually less likely to be easily disgusted. We found this, even though we were able to statistically control for a variety of factors that we know are related both to disgust sensitivity and to political orientation like socioeconomic status, income, education levels, religiosity, even some of the big personality traits that we know are associated with both. No matter what, we still found a general relationship between disgust sensitivity, how easily disgusted you are, and your political beliefs. And this actually predicted not just how you respond on a one to seven scale of how politically conservative you are or liberal, but it also seemed to predict actual voting behavior. That is, when we looked at state by state voting results in the 2008 US presidential election, what we found was that levels of disgust sensitivity in a state predicted the margin of victory of Obama over McCain. That is, states that had in general higher levels of disgust sensitivity were uh, states where McCain actually got more votes compared to Obama. Now, we were wondering whether this was maybe just a feature of American politics, so we looked across the world. Across 121 different countries, here you see collapsed into a number of geographical regions, we asked the same kinds of political questions and discussed sensitivity questions. And what we were able to see was, uh, these numbers indicate the strength of the relationship, that is the correlation between discussed sensitivity and political orientation. What you see is no matter where you look across the world, the same result emerges, that is, by and large, the more likely you are to be easily disgusted, the more likely you are to be politically conservative. Or again, you're liberal if you're not easily disgusted. Now, this is a fairly small effect. This, is, this accounts for a small part of why we might have political beliefs, but nonetheless it's interesting because most people might not think that how easily disgusted they are by things like unflushed toilets or sipping on a stranger's soda might actually predict who they vote for in a presidential election. One of the questions that we had was whether we could actually shift people's attitudes towards social groups and moral and political attitudes in particularly by making them disgusted. So what we did at Cornell in our lab was bring participants into the lab and ask them to fill out a series of questionnaires. In this particular study, we asked them to evaluate certain social groups. We knew that there was a strong link between homosexuality and uh, disgust because of the way that many people who are anti-homosexual talk about the sex act and use disgust in order to convince people. So we wanted to see if, uh, if making people disgusted in a completely unrelated way, that is, we weren't making them disgusted about sex or anything like that, we were making them disgusted with a foul odor. Essentially, we sprayed the room with a really nasty odor on every other day, and we brought participants into the lab and asked them what they thought about certain social groups. African Americans, the elderly, immigrants, gay men, and lesbian women. And what we found was that the foul odor had a particularly strong effect. In fact, the only effect we found was that it made people negatively evaluate gay men more. So that is, on the days when people had to evaluate gay men where there was a foul smell in the room, they were more likely to find, to report greater negative attitudes. Here this is plotting on a feeling thermometer. That is, from 0 to 100, how warmly or coldly do you feel toward gay men? Other labs have also looked at these differences using physiological measures. You might wonder whether self-report, that is, if, you ask, if I ask you how easily disgusted you are, maybe you're not so accurate. 
But if I hook you up to physiological measures, measures of heartbeat and skin conductance that we know are, are rough measures of arousal, and show you disgusting images, we find the same general effect. People who report being greater conservatives, uh, more likely to be politically conservative, are more physiologically aroused when presented with disgusting images. Liberals are less physically aroused. In particular, um, attitudes towards homosexuality and abortion were the ones that predicted more, most, whether or not people would be aroused by disgusting images that had nothing to do with those issues, such as dog feces. Well, there's another way to kick in this feeling that there might be contamination in the environment. So disgust is a particularly powerful way to do this, but disgust, again, is in the service of keeping us from getting sick. You can show similar effects by just reminding people that there is disease prevalent in the environment. And a number of researchers have used this disease avoidance as a manipulation. We thought, well, perhaps just reminding people that there's contamination in the environment might get them to change their political and moral attitudes. So we conducted a study where all we did was remind people that the swine flu was, was prevalent in Cornell and that they should uh, sanitize their hands. In one case, we explicitly told them that they should sanitize their hands and ask them a number of, of questions about their moral beliefs and their political beliefs. In another case, we actually just asked them to fill out a questionnaire either next to a hand sanitizing station or not. And what we found is, was that a simple reminder to wash your hands actually had a pretty strong effect on your moral beliefs. In this case, beliefs about sexually weird but harmless uh, practices. I'll give you an example. Um, so we asked people, imagine that uh, Joe is house sitting for his grandmother, and Joe invites his girlfriend over, and they have sex on his grandmother's bed. Now, if I just reminded you that you should wash your hands because of the swine flu, you're more likely to find that to be morally wrong than if I hadn't. When we asked people to report their political orientation in the same set of studies, we also found this general effect that simply reminding people to wash their hands had a change in how conservative they reported being, politically conservative. So again, a simple reminder of disgust or of contamination can change our consumer decisions, it can change our political decisions, it can change our moral decisions. This is a case in which disgust is not simply preventing us from eating things that might make us sick, but it's having a fairly profound influence on our social, political, moral judgments. The question that I want to leave you with is, now that we know this, we can finally get to the point where we can ask, when should emotions influence our thinking? Science isn't particularly well suited to answer this question. All we can do is point out how emotions work, how emotions can influence the way we make decisions and judgments. Um, but we have to now ask the additional question, now that we know that, should disgust shape the way, for instance, you vote, who you vote for in the political, in the political elections, what you vote for about gay rights, or what you buy at the grocery store? Thank you very much.